Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Strings of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me. And I'll never be alone. Come now, found, come now, King. Come now, precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come now, found of our blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never Church, I uh, just want to say thank you for everybody for being here this morning, and if you are a visitor, you're our honored guest, and uh, we're just so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, don't run off after service. The ladies have made some welcome gifts, and if you are a visitor, you uh, are entitled to one, and we would love to give you one, and they'll be out in the foyer after service, and we'd love to talk to you and, and get to know you a little bit. So uh, thank you for being here again, and let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we just humbly come before you. We thank you so much for being able to gather here this morning. And Father, we just ask that you would guide our hearts and minds this morning as we worship you. We pray that it would be pleasing to you. And Father, we just uh, pray for everybody that is here, every soul, every family that's represented, and those that aren't able to be here, uh, shut-ins and those that are dealing with illness and just couldn't make it today. We just pray that you would be with all of us, guide us, bless us. And Father, we just pray for our country. We ask for unity. And Father, I just pray that we as a people would return to you and that you would heal us and forgive us of our sins. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is a song that we learned last year. Um, does any of y'all remember, does it look familiar? Jesus, draw me ever nearer. Okay, so we're going to try it and we'll keep going because... There's nothing surprising in it. So when we get through the first verse, the second verse should be just like it with just different words. So, Jesus, draw me ever nearer. 
as I labor through the storm, you have called me to this passage, and I'll follow, though I'm worn. May this journey bring a blessing. May I rise on wings of faith at the end of my heart's testing with your likeness let me wake Jesus guide me through the tempest keep my spirit stay Let me love you even more. May this journey bring a blessing. May I rise on wings of faith at the end of As I go at the end of this long passage, let me leave them at your throne. May this journey bring a blessing. Christ for the world we sing. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring. With loving zeal. The poor and them that mourn. The faint and overborn. Sin sick and sorrow. For the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring with fervent prayer. The wayward and the lost by restless passions cost, redeemed at countless cost. From dark despair, Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring with one accord, with us the work to share, with us reproach to bear, with Cross to bear for Christ. I
Before our thoughts on the giving, will you stand as we sing, Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your compares to the promise I have in you, my Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's the time we've set aside each week to give back what we've been blessed with. The money that we give here is, is used to, to build and to glorify God's kingdom. It's used for missions here and abroad. It's used for feeding the hungry. In general, it's just used for sharing the gospel. We set this time apart out of convenience, mostly. We've been called to give back, and this is the time that we have to do that. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all that we have. We know that all these blessings come from you. Father, we know that we have the responsibility of, of being good stewards of these blessings. Help us, Father, to give back cheerfully and thoughtfully now. We thank you for all things, in Jesus' name, amen.
Before our thoughts on the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain for me If you'd turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we'll be starting in verse 12 through the end of the chapter.
For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for, our God, it is for God, or if we are of sign, sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We meet together every first day of the week. We take the bread and the cup to remember God, our Jesus' sacrifice. God sent Jesus here so that we can be reconciled back to him because we couldn't do it on our own. So uh, we take... We take the time to reflect upon that each and every first day of the week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you were willing to send Jesus for us. Father, we understand that we cannot come to you on our own, and we are grateful that uh, Jesus is the way. Father, be with us as we take this bread as we reflect upon that sacrifice and his willingness to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
pray again for the cup. Father, we come to you again thanking you for Jesus' sacrifice, for the blood he shed that covers over our sins. Father, we thank you that uh, he was raised again to conquer death. Father, help us to reflect on that sacrifice, not just at this moment, but every day. In Jesus' name, amen. For our scripture reading and lesson, we'll sing Zion's Call, if you would stand for the song, and the scripture reading afterwards. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us list to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. On the road to the goal, burdens we must bear, but we have help from realms above. We receive courage new when we kneel in prayer. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne of 
while we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us hear the call of love. This morning's scripture reading will be from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theopolis, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This is Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and worship you this morning. Please bless our worship and let it be satisfying to your eyes. Bless John with the words, your words, to deliver to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to everyone. So good to see you here today. Hope you're doing well, it's always good to be together and to worship God together. It's a great opportunity to renew our minds for this week that we have ahead of us. Um, and there's a lot going on in that week, just in general. Summer's a busy time, it seems. A lot going on in, in church and in our lives. We've had different uh, events and trips over the last several weeks. We've got our summer of services continuing even tonight and hope you'll show up for that. And that's a great thing. We're, we're starting a new series this morning in just a, a few moments. So it's, it's busy around here at the church. For Personally, it's been busy for us as well. About our, my surgery and, and the aftermath of, of that. We've had a couple of family weddings. We've traveled to, or Courtney has at least, to have had a niece born this last week. And in a couple of weeks, you probably noticed in the progress, that the house is getting closer to done. So we'll be moving in there pretty soon. So we're excited for that, to get out of the apartment and into the, the house and to have a, a little more room will be great and we're going to need it because in about five months we will be a family of three. <laughs> if, you, if you couldn't interpret that, ba baby Bradford is due in, in December. <laughs> I think most of you got it though. <laughs> So we are so excited to share that with you all this morning. Um, God gives so many blessings. They're not something to be taken for granted, but he has certainly blessed us this year with things that we have prayed about and hoped for. First, given us a, a great church family here to 
come be a part of and serve, and then hopefully the book end by His grace of the year will be a, a child to, to have with us and to, to share love with and to be a part of this family here as well. So we're, we're so excited for that. Um, I debated whether to say this before or after the sermon. I chose before, which means you have to wait about 30 minutes before you can bombard us with questions <laughs> and, and have to try to now refocus for a sermon. So that was the danger of the before, but that's what I chose. <laughs> So we'll do our best with that. I will say, by the way, also, we're excited to share that with our family. We're still waiting a couple of weeks before we sort of publicly post that. Obviously, this is being streamed, but most people don't actually watch this just out there in the world who know us per se. Um, So just keep that in mind. But we we are excited to share that with all of you this morning and for all that will be coming uh, with that in the future. It may seem less exciting now, but we are starting a new series this morning. (laughs) If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1, where we'll be this morning. I've had trouble with this clicker the last couple of weeks, so we'll see if it starts working. I've reset it a couple of times. We're starting this series out of Acts. Acts pursuing God's mission. And I'm hoping this is going to be a a powerful series for us from a a powerful book of God's Word. Acts is a book of history. It it is a book that continues the story of God's people. The Gospels sort of begin that story in the story of Jesus and His disciples. And then Acts picking up in the story of the early church and, and how it began and is it spread out into the world and pursued God's mission and all that came with that. So it's this history, but it's the story of of God's mission. And I think it is a story that is descriptive, but also prescriptive. It's describing those early years of the church and all that came with that. And it's just an incredible story to read at times of seeing what what happened in the, the lives of the apostles and of the, of the church in a larger way. But also, it is a story that I think is, is prescriptive. And maybe not in every way. We read some of this, the details of it, and say that that's very different from what we face. Or maybe some, some of the things that um, it looked like for them are different than for us. But I think it's a story that in many ways speaks to us and challenges us as we try to live out our call, as we try to live out lives of mission for God. And so we're going to hopefully see that in the coming weeks as we look at it. Acts is a a long book. We're not going to do every chapter. That would take half a year or more to do that. What we are going to do is try to draw out various sections in this book that I think speak to the mission that we are called to. The common mission that we have with these Christians from 2,000 years ago. And I think it has so much to, to tell us about that, to, to encourage us with, to challenge us with, about our calling, but about God's work in this as well. And I hope it just renews us and motivates us to pursue that mission in the coming weeks. And that we can take away some key lessons that we need to learn if we're going to be people of mission. And so I, I hope that you'll, you'll come back in the coming weeks as we work our way through this. Acts chapter 1, though, gets it all started. And it's this transition moment from from the life of Jesus to now the church continuing on as He won't be there physically with them, at least, anymore. And it begins like this. The first three verses, let me read, and then we'll go from there. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when He was taken up, after He had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom He had chosen. He presented... It's working now and we're fighting in our transitioning. (laughs) We're good for the moment. I may need you more in the future. Verse 3 says, He presented Himself alive to them after His suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
So the first three verses, we see several things right off the bat. Uh, one, is, one is just the background here of, of who's writing and who he's, he's writing to. In this first book, O Theophilus. And, and from this, we see who's writing and who's being written to. And somewhat we know this from tradition as well, but this is the same intro from the Gospel of, of Luke. Luke is also written to this Theophilus. And, and so that in Christian tradition tells us that this is written by Luke, who was a, a co-worker of Paul, um, a leader in the early church, one who didn't necessarily uh, walk with Jesus as a disciple or see all these things, but we read in Luke how he, he investigated them well. Of course, the Holy Spirit guided him in this to tell that story. And, and he wanted to do the same for the story of the early church as well. And so this all comes down to us eventually in these, these two works, but they're sort of meant to be one. The Gospel of John breaks them up, but Luke and Acts very much go together from the same author. There are some similar themes that are drawn out in them. But Luke writes these two works, and he writes them to this Theophilus. And we don't know exactly who this Theophilus is. Maybe it's a little strange that these, these works that have come to be read by so many millions of people in the world were eventually written for this, this one man. It seems like perhaps he was um, a young Christian, one who was needing to hear about these, these words at the beginning of, of Luke. Um, Luke speaks that he, he, he's writing this, that he would be confident about some of these things that he's been taught. And so Luke's investigated this, and he, he wants Theophilus to be confident about this, to know these things are true, that he can be rooted in them. And so now he's continuing on. I want you to, to know about the work of the church and, and how Christ's work has, con, has continued in that. And so he writes to, to Theophilus, and I'm so grateful that he did so that we have this. But then he makes this interesting comment. He makes this interesting comment as he's beginning this in, in verse 1. In this first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. You see, we, we can look at this and say that the, the work of Jesus is sort of done now. You, you could look at it that way, and maybe some would look at it that way. That Jesus came and he, he lived his life of, of, of 33 or so years, and he had his three years of, of ministry that he lived, and that's... That's Jesus. That, that's Jesus' story. That's Jesus' time. That, that He came and he, he taught and He healed and He did all these things. And He did His work in that time. Not just that, but of course, giving His life in atonement for the sins of the people. That, that, that's Jesus' time, but now His time is done and His work is done. And now in Acts, what we're reading is the story of, of His people, the story of the church. But then this, this phrase that it begins... This gospel begins with, uh, and I think that word began here. I have dealt previously with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And there's something assumed in that and something important in that. That in the gospel of Luke, we read about the things that Jesus has done in the past from their perspective. But the work of Jesus is not done. The work of Jesus was not done for them in their moment. The work of Jesus is not done now. He says all that Jesus began to do and teach, and this could just simply be a reference to those, those 40 days before His ascension after He was resurrected where He continued to teach them things, but I think it's a reference to, to everything that's going to come after here in this book of Acts. We think about this book of Acts, and you look at in your Bibles at the top, it probably says Acts of the Apostles. And of course, these, these titles get, get added later by, by editors um, of Scripture over time, not necessarily given by, by the authors. And you could think of this as Acts of the Apostles. I mean, you read through the story, it's the story of the early church, but it, it's the apostles in particular, and even more in particular, uh, Peter and Paul sort of get their, their halves of the Gospels, uh, or of, of the book of Acts. But I think we could also say... We could also rightly title this book as, as the continuing acts of Jesus Christ through His church and by the power of His Spirit. And as we, we work through this, what we're going to see is, is how much these early Christians did. Some of the amazing things they did and the way they put themselves out there for this mission. 
what we're going to see again and again as well is that God is at work in all of this. And that is so significant. Both things are, are so significant. And as we work our way through, through Acts, we're, we're going to see that the significance of our work and giving ourselves, but, but God, Christ's, the Spirit's work in all of this. Christ, in His life, in those 33 or so years, did a lot of things, but His work was not over. His work is not over for one reason, I think we could say, but because of this idea that we see in verse 3. That during these 40 days, he, he continued to speak to them about the kingdom of God. And understand, this is not a new topic for Jesus. If you look back in the Gospels and you see what Jesus taught from the very beginning, you'll see that he taught about the kingdom of God. He, he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, and his gospel is even referred to as a, a gospel of the kingdom. Not just a, a gospel of forgiveness, a gospel of, of atonement for your sins, though, though that's, that's a piece of it, that's a part of it. But from the beginning, he spoke about a coming kingdom, the coming kingdom of God. And what we see here is that that, that kingdom still has not come in its fullness. It, it, it has begun to come. It has begun to sort of break into this world in its strange way. But at this time, and even in our time, they're still waiting for, for the culmination of that, for the, the total fulfillment of, of God's kingdom being one with creation, of His, His rule being complete, of all recognizing that. And so Jesus, though He has made atonement for sin, He has been raised up to new life. This kingdom work is still ongoing. And until that kingdom is established in full, His work will continue. And so Jesus began to work, but He is still working. And the, the disciples, as we pick up here in Acts, that they are waiting. They are waiting for, for what comes next. And so we keep on reading. And we read this as they're, as they're waiting and they're wondering and they're asking about what comes next and when will it come next. Christ is, is still at work. Um, but the disciples, as, as we read on, are, they're asking about this and, and they're, they're waiting for this. Verse 4, it says, And while staying with them, He, that's Jesus, ordered them, the disciples, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You have heard from Me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So they are, they are waiting as they were instructed. That they, are, they are waiting. He told them not to depart from Jerusalem. So they're, they're, they're waiting there for for something, for this, this promise of the Father. Maybe there's a lot to that, to that promise of the Father, that though Jesus speaks to, here to this Holy Spirit and this baptism with the Spirit. Now put that in your back pocket for now. We're sort of, we'll get back to that in a few moments. But then he makes this promise, but also they're, they're thinking, and we know they're thinking about this because they ask about it, they're thinking about the kingdom. But because of Jesus has been teaching about it, but because of the significance of the kingdom to them. That the, we, we think about the Gospels and the Jews in this first century were, were waiting for the kingdom of God. They, they were waiting for, for God's rule to, to come into creation. They were waiting for the, the restoration of Israel. That they, they were waiting for and they were, they were hoping that, that Israel would, would once again um, not be under the rule of another, that Rome might be overthrown is what most were, were hoping for, and that Israel could be established and a new king would be established and that it would be peace and prosperity for Israel once again, that righteousness would, would be there, that, that things would be as they, they once were, as they think back to like the days of, of David and Solomon. They, they were hoping for that. 
And we can see in the Gospels them hoping for this and looking for that and Jesus having to, to correct them, having to challenge them a little bit in this. As they're, they're hoping for that and maybe some of them are ready to, let's take up the sword to pursue this. Or they're looking forward to that day of, of they're going to be lifted up and all, all the power they're going to have from that. And Jesus challenges them. He, he, he teaches them about the way of the cross. That He came not to be served, but to serve. And that they need to follow that way. And so He's challenged them on this. That, that they understand that they've missed the point to a certain degree, but, but they're still hoping for the kingdom. That they're still thinking, now are you going to restore the kingdom? Okay, you had to die on the cross, you had to be resurrected, but, but, but now will the kingdom come in in its fullness as we've been hoping for? They're still thinking this way. And I think we can be critical about them. We can be, be critical toward them about that. It's easy to do that. But, but then I think actually we need to give them a little grace here. That, that, that even understanding what has happened in the past and how they were corrected in the time of Jesus' ministry, they're still hoping for the kingdom. And that's not a wrong thing to be hoping for. That one day the kingdom will be established. Je Jesus has promised that. And so in their mind, they don't know what comes next, even as Jesus has been teaching them. And they're desiring that they're longing for the kingdom. And so I think their question is natural. Are you going to do this now? Is this all going to be in a big swoop now? Are you going to do all that we've hoped for and establish this kingdom of Israel again? And, and I think what we see in that is this desire they have for the kingdom that, that is a natural desire. That this natural desire for God's reign, for God's rule to come on earth as it is in heaven. Whether in a, in a place as they were hoping or, or more broadly than that. I think they desired that. And don't we desire that? I, I think we do. I, I think I can say with confidence this morning that, that we all desire the kingdom of God. I, I mean, you, you look around you and we desire peace, do we not? <coughs> When we see wars and, and violence, and even po political violence in our own country, even, even yesterday, and we desire peace, do we not? <laughs> and we look around us and we desire righteousness and justice when we see evil and, and wrong around us. And we want, we want what is right to reign. And, and we desire goodness and, and blessing for, for ourselves and for, for all around us. We desire fulfillment for our lives. We, we desire these things that, that we associate with, with God's kingdom, with God's blessing. We desire these things. We desire the kingdom. But I think what is also true is that so often we, we, we seek it in the wrong ways. We seek it in the wrong places or, or by the wrong means, the wrong ways. It's so easy to misunderstand the kingdom. We may misunderstand it as, as something that, that we can build or that we can bring about by, by our own power, by our own strength, by our own ingenuity through, through various means, um, maybe through our political efforts, whatever it is. And sometimes we look at this as sort of our, our personal kingdom that, that I'm trying to, to build the good life for myself. And to the extent that I can do that, I've got my kingdom right here. And so maybe I'm not even concerned as much with the, the bigger kingdom of God. I think that's how a lot of people are living their lives. And they're content if they have that kingdom. But then sometimes we are thinking bigger than that. We're, sort of, we're, we're trying to build the kingdom of God through, through a particular nation. That, that we, wherever we live, that sort of represents the kingdom of God to us. If we could just make it like the kingdom of God through, through political means or, or through, through the sword, perhaps, even in history. We, we, we've seen this, that, that maybe the, the, think of the kingdom of God as something we could, we could vote in or we could force in through our own efforts in a nation or, or in the world as a whole. But understand this, the kingdom of God is not something you can vote into being or conquer into being. It's not something you can buy or create by your own power in your own life. The kingdom of God is from God himself. It is from the, the power of God. And I think there's, there's a few things we could say about God's kingdom that's different from how we think about kingdoms of this world and maybe even the kingdom of God at times and how Jesus has to correct his own disciples and they have to come to understand a few things we can mention. One, it, it's, it's a spiritual kingdom. 
it, it's a spiritual kingdom, which is not to say that there's not a, a, a more physical component to it, or, or that there won't one day be a, a, a place or the kingdom won't be established in a fuller kind of sense. It, it will one day in the future. Well, when Christ returns and establishes everything, the kingdom will be something that you can sort of see and touch in, in, in a more real sense. When we think about Jesus' own words in the Gospels and challenging them, said, it, it's not something you'll necessarily see. It's not something you'll just look around you and say, there it is, the kingdom has come. But it, it, it's a spiritual thing. It, it, it's, it's the people who are giving themselves over to the rule of God you can't necessarily see it in this, in this place or this people that looks like this, but it's the people who have put their faith in Christ that make up this kingdom. It's spiritual, and because of that, it's global. It's not contained to just this people in this place who look this way, but it's all those around the world who have given that faith. And third, it's gradual in its expansion. It doesn't just show up in the moment in this time. That one day when Christ is going to return, he, he can, in the blink of an eye, make all things as they should be. But, but in the here and now, this kingdom gradually moves out. It gradually expands. And the fourth, I would say this, it comes by God's power. As it slowly expands in the here and now, it comes by God's power. And one day when it is established in full, it will be by God's power. There's more we can say, but I think we can say all of these things about this kingdom. And when we understand that, it helps to frame a little bit of what our work is to do in the here and now is we wait and we hope for the kingdom of God to come. If we continue on here, and I just want to read verse 7 again, but look at verses 7 and 8. As they're asking about the kingdom, Jesus reminds them of this in verse 7. He says, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He says, It's not for you to know. Back in verse 7. They want to know, will you establish this kingdom right now? Or when will you establish it in its fullness? And I think it's significant what he says to them here. And they needed to understand, that we need to understand, some things just aren't for us to know. So some things are beyond our knowledge. Some things are beyond our power. They're the things that we can know, and they're the things that we can do. And then they're the things that are of God's knowledge and of God's power. And knowing the difference is important. That there are some things that, that are the secret things of God that we just don't need to concern ourselves with. That, that, that they might be interesting to, to think about, or if we could know, but, but we can't know them. He, he hasn't decided to reveal them to us. And, and ultimately, it's just not helpful. And, and so when will He do this? He says, don't concern yourself with that. that these things are, are beyond your need to know. They're beyond your power. But there are some things that you do need to know. And he tells them this in verse 8. And a couple of things he mentions. And this is really the key verse of our section this morning in chapter 1. A couple of things. But the first one I want to highlight is this. He says that you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. He gives them this calling. He tells them the work that they have to do. And I think it's significant as he's telling them this because there is a work that they have to do. This isn't a passive thing. And yet there are limits to what they can do as well. I think there's two dangers we can sort of run into at times. One is just to sort of get passive and sit back and say, well, there's nothing for me to do. I trust God with all of this. If I've received my forgiveness, I've been saved. And so now I'm going to I'm going to sit back and just, just wait for God to sort of take me to glory. Or, or even if there is a sense of mission, I'm just going to, I'm going to trust God with that. A very passive kind of thing. And it's good to trust God, but, but we have to understand there's something for us to do as well. But then on the other side, it's just saying it's all on us. You know, Christ gave us this example 
But, but, but now it's on us to take that example and, and build something out of it. Build the kingdom by our, by our power, by our work in, in this world. The truth is this, though. We are all called to work from the kingdom, for the kingdom. But only God has the power to build the kingdom. And so Jesus tells them their work. They have work, but it's a very specific calling. He says, you will be my witnesses. Well, what is a witness? A witness has a couple of meanings that are related. A witness is someone who saw something, who witnessed something. But then on the other hand, maybe it's someone who reports something about what they saw. We think about a witness in a trial who stands up in that courtroom and says, this is what, this is what I saw. That this is my, my testimony about what happened. So that, that's a witness. And, and you think about the idea of witnessing. And it is both a, a passive and an active idea. I, I mean, it's active. You're, you're doing something. You're reporting something. You're, you're sharing what is true based on what you have seen and what you have experienced. And the, and the sharing of that truth can accomplish something. And yet at the same time, you're pointing to something beyond yourself. You're witnessing to what you saw. You're witnessing to a truth. And as we think about this role that Jesus gives to the disciples, and I think gives to us as well, it's a similar idea. There is a passive and an active element to that. That there is a work, a calling to us in this, and yet a limitation to us in this. Because we think about the gospel and we think about the, the mission of God. Here's the truth. Jesus has done the hard work. And, and He will do the hard work in His gospel. It, it is Jesus who, who came to earth and who lived that perfect life. It is Jesus who, who gave His perfect life as an atonement for sins. It is Jesus who was raised out of the grave to, to defeat death and bring new life. It is Jesus who will one day return and will usher in this kingdom in, in its fullness. But somebody has to make it known. It's Jesus who has done this. It's Jesus' power at work. But, but, but if, that, if that work, if that gospel is going to make a difference for people in this world, someone has to make it known. Paul speaks to this in, in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 14 and 15, just that this importance of, of, of sharing these things. He, he says this there. How then will they call on Him and who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? For this, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is true, but someone has to take that that message. Jesus has done the work, but, but who will witness to it? And so as we think about our calling, we think about our mission. I think here's what we see, Cal, if you can move that slide over for me. That our role is, is limited, but it is so essential. Our, our role is limited. At the end of the day, we are witnesses to the greatness of Christ and what He has done in His gospel. We cannot build the kingdom of God by our own power. We are witnesses, and yet that role as witnesses is so essential. And God uses it as He builds His kingdom. For that ultimate day, when it will come in His fullness, we testify to it. And as we do this, by God's power, we can make a difference in this world around us. And Jesus says this, that we're, we're going to make a difference as, as we witness, but we're going to witness not just where we are, but, but to the ends of the earth. He says in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's telling these disciples in Jerusalem, you're, you're going to witness to me where you're at, but you're, you're not going to stop there. You're, you're going to keep moving out into Judea, the surrounding area, and into, into Samaria, and ultimately to the, to the ends of the earth in their minds, sort of the, the Roman world, that you're going to take it wherever it might go. The gospel starts where we are, but it keeps on moving. It, it won't stop until the whole earth has received it. I don't know how, how 
literal to take that. Some, some take that, that very literal as, as if Christ can't come back until everyone has had a chance to hear this. And I don't know exactly what that might mean or what that might look like, but I know this, that there are numerous people groups, even today, who have not heard the gospel. This work is not finished. And it is so significant for the work of Christ, for the coming of His kingdom, and for a hope for those in this world. That's a big thing when you think about it. And it's easy to think about that and to think about the disciples to think about us and say, they and we are so inadequate for that task. Even understanding our, our role is limited, that we're just witnesses. When you think about that, a whole world that needs to hear about Christ and, and so many who still have it to this, to this day. Imagine they must have felt inadequate about this as they thought about spreading this out through the whole Roman Empire. And us today, and the world sort of feels smaller today with just all the advances that we've made in technology and we feel more connected. But I think I'm speaking to people who may feel just as inadequate. And I know at times I feel inadequate about this. Sometimes if you feel inadequate just to do this in our own community, let alone to the ends of the earth. But the good news is this, that God's calling comes with God's power. That, that He makes us adequate for this calling. And so we look into this that we've been reading here. Kyle, if you can advance that for him. And, and before, he, he even says about this calling, He told them this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In verse 5, referring back to these words that John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with, with the Holy Spirit. He says, you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You, you see, these two things go together. That they, they have to go together. And actually, I think it's significant that the promise comes first. The, the mission is inseparable from God's power. I think what Jesus is telling them here is that they cannot move forward in their own power. That this mission isn't even worth pursuing apart from the power of God. That there would be no chance for them to fulfill what is being asked of them without the power of God with them. And very soon, and in spectacular fashion, what we're going to see is the Spirit is going to come upon these disciples. And it's going to equip them for this mission. It's going to give them words to say, it's going to cause them to be able to speak in other languages that, that people can, can hear this gospel. They're going to heal and they're going to do miracles and they're going to do all these things and they're going to testify to Christ by this and the church is going to grow through this by this power. This is the story of Acts as the church moves forward through the, the work of these apostles and these early Christians, but by the, the power of God through them in the church. This is the story of Acts. You can go to the next slide, Kyle. That God gives power for His mission. And I think the question is this. Does this mean anything for us? Or is it just an interesting part of the early history of the church? Does the Spirit do the same for us? Or are we just as dependent on it as we try to participate in God's mission? Or is it on us? And I think we have to understand a couple of things this morning. One, our receipt of the Spirit may not look exactly like theirs. And our gifts of the Spirit may not look exactly like theirs. But I believe this, that the big principle remains the same. That we pursue the mission of God and we do it by the power of God. Now understand this, that there is the rule and there are exceptions to the rule. And I believe that, that's the rule, that, that we pursue this mission and we pursue it by the, by the power that God gives us in His Spirit. But there are exceptions to the rule at times in Scripture. The rule is this, the, the Spirit is the seal of our salvation. It, it is the, the source of our strength. And it is the, the gift to all Christians. And, and normally, it, it is received at our baptism. That when we are baptized in water, giving our faith to Christ, that the receipt of the Spirit comes with that. 
Now, there are, there are exceptions in the story of Acts to that, strange cases. And I think sometimes we see that for, for specific reasons with, with the apostles here who are perhaps were, were baptized by the baptism of, of John. I don't know if they were baptized again after the resurrection of Jesus or not. We don't have that recorded. But, but they received this spirit coming on them in Acts chapter 2 to, to empower them for mission. And I think it's just an example of God in this pivotal moment was sort of doing something extraordinary to, to make a point about how his power was going to strengthen them for this mission. We're thinking about Cornelius who, who received the Spirit before his baptism in chapter 10. And it was this example that, that Peter and all would understand that the God was open to the Gentiles as being part of his kingdom. These are sort of the, the exceptions. But, but, but the rule is that the, the norm that we see throughout Scripture in Acts, Acts 2, 38, is that when we are baptized, we receive forgiveness of sins, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we do, and if you're a Christian this morning, if you have put your faith in Christ and been baptized into Christ, the Spirit is with you, that when we receive it, I believe this principle still applies, that this Spirit empowers us for God's mission. Maybe that power doesn't look like healings. Maybe it doesn't look like speaking in tongues. But I think it absolutely empowers us for this mission. I'm going to say a few ways I think the Spirit still empowers us for mission today as we try to sort of bring some of this together. First of all, this. If you want to write down some of these texts, I'll just allude to them here. I believe the Spirit gives us personal conviction of the truth of the gospel. I believe that the Spirit helps aid us in coming to believe it in the first place as we hear it. But, but then as we live out our lives more and more, it is the Spirit of God within us that helps it to become more and more real to us. Not by passive ways, but we pursue this through spiritual disciplines and the life of the church in other ways. But the Spirit is within us convicting us about this, making it more true and real for us that we might want to pursue God more and more, that we might want to pursue His mission more and more. I believe the Spirit gives us courage and boldness. And we see this throughout the book of Acts as the church is given this supernatural boldness to pursue this mission that is hard to pursue. And sometimes it's hard for us to pursue, but I believe the Spirit of God within us can give us that boldness to step out and do hard things. I believe the Spirit gave them and still gives us wisdom and the right words to say. And I don't know what exactly that looks like. I don't know if they had a, a teleprompter in their, their minds basically for what they were saying at some times. Maybe it didn't work that way, and it's never worked that way for me, but I, I truly believe that God gives us a wisdom in the words to say at times that we need. We may not even be uh, able to realize it, but I believe He does this. I believe this as well, that the Spirit, just as it did in Acts 16 for Lydia, opens hearts to those who we attempt to share the gospel with. Maybe it doesn't look as miraculous of the Spirit coming down in tongues of fire on us when we receive that Spirit at our baptism. And maybe our gifts don't look quite as spectacular at times. But if you are a Christian this morning, you are filled with God's Spirit. And if you are filled with God's Spirit, I believe you are equipped and empowered for the whole of the Christian life. But understand this, you are equipped and empowered for the mission that God has given to you. Amen. He calls us to be witnesses. And He gives us the power to live that out. As we finish our section this morning, and Kyle, if you can move me through verses 9 through 11 here. The section finishes this way. It says, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus ascends into heaven. And the disciples, they're looking up at this and they're amazed. And I imagine they're shocked. And I imagine they're questioning what is happening here, even as Jesus has spoke to them and perhaps prepared them for some of this. And the angels speak to them and said, basically, you know, what are you doing? Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up, He will one day return 
as you saw him go into heaven. And it's sort of a strange statement, but in my mind, at least my understanding, it's almost as if the angels are saying, what are you doing? He's gone physically now, but he'll be back one day. And in the here and now, you've got work to do. You've got a calling to do that he has left for you. And I think that's the takeaway for us this morning. If you can advance to that last slide, Kyle. As we think about this, this message and we think about this book of Acts that we're going to be in and trying to, to learn about God's mission, let's get to work. God has given us the power to pursue it. And He has given us a missional calling to be His witnesses in the world, to witness to Jesus Christ and His Gospel in all that we say and in all that we do, that people might come to know Him and grow in the fullness of salvation in Him. He has given us this incredible work. Let's get to it. And we're going to be thinking about that in the coming weeks in this we're thinking about it in other aspects of our church life as well. We're thinking about it even tonight as well. And I invite you to come back this afternoon at 5 for our summer of service. And we're thinking about how to, how to know our neighbors better. That we might one day wit love them, but, but witness to them eventually. We're going to be talking about that this afternoon. Come back for that. But we are His witnesses. Let's get to work in that. We're going to sing a song in just a second. As always, it's an invitation for any who, who need the prayers of the church, who need strength, who, who need to respond in some way, whether that's to, to respond to the gospel or, or just to, to respond to the need for prayer um, and the strength that can come through that. We'd love to help you in, any, in that way or any other way if we can. If we can do that, I'd ask that you come as we stand together and as we sing. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my heart, I pray.
is going to be loved. No question about that. Ladies, it's going to be like Baskin Robbins. You're going to have to pick a number. <laughs> and I want you guys to know this, I've already told you this. Your identity is about to change. Um, you are now going to be the parents of, not John and Corbin. So, congratulations. All right, I'll try and be quick. I know we're running a little bit over. Um, elders and deacons meeting today at 3. Uh, El Salvador missions presentation, bef uh, excuse me, will be after the fellowship meal this Wednesday. Uh, the team that went to El Salvador will be sharing a presentation with us. Uh, look forward to that. Ladies retreat. Ladies are invited to attend the Transform Ladies Conference. This is in September. So if ladies, if you are going to that, make sure you sign up. A few birthdays. The remainder of the month, uh, Steve Matheny, July 16th, uh, Jeannie Weaver, 17th, and Darby Austin and Barbara Onquist on the 18th. And we do have a special birthday girl today. It's Edie's birthday. So uh, let's sing happy birthday right quick to Edie. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Edie. Happy birthday to you. All right. Good job. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we just are so thankful to be able to gather here today. Thank you for John's words of encouragement. And Father, we just pray that you would stir us by your spirit and help us to accomplish what you will for us in our lives and uh, spread your message to those that we come in contact with. Father, bless us. Be with us as we depart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.